Welcome back to Lab at Home with the Museum of Life and Science. My name is Peregrine and we have a Catalyst volunteer here um, who is moderating the chat. I also have a really special guest who we're going to introduce in a moment. Um, the way that all of you participate in this program is by using the uh, moderated chat. I hope that you'll help uh, lead our program with your thoughts and questions and ideas. So I'm here with a really special friend, um, Heather Chandler, who I think she can probably introduce herself a little bit better than I can. So I'll turn it over to her in a minute. Heather Chandler is a video game producer. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means and who you are, Heather? Absolutely. Well, first of all, I'm so excited to be here. Um, this is going to be really fun today. And my name is Heather and I make video games. As a game producer for 25 years, I've collaborated with lots of engineers, artists, and designers to create games on every platform you can imagine. PC, console, mobile, VR, AR. I've contributed to over 40 games, some you've heard of like Fortnite, and others you might know like Never Alone, which is a really fun game. And in school, I had a passion for math, science, and art, and I wanted a career that combined all of these. And making games wasn't something that I had really thought about because I thought that you had to be a programmer in order to do this. But during my first job, I learned there are many ways to contribute to making a game because it's very much a collaborative team effort. And so it's really all about uh, finding your skill and getting together with a group of people who together have the ability to program, design, um, you know, make art and to make this game, to make these games. And in my role as a producer, it's my job to kind of sit in the middle of all the stuff that's happening on the team and help them bring all these pieces together so that we can actually make a game, test it and get it launched so that people can play it. That sounds, that is so cool. That sounds like so much fun. I, I hope that it is. I, I know that um, we've got a lot of really cool questions um, that we have had submitted for you about uh, more about what you do. Um, but I thought that we might take a quick pause. Um, we are going to get the opportunity to talk to you today to hear more um, from you about what you do. Um, and we are going to be kind of all doing an activity together that kind of shows a little bit, maybe a small part of how um, game development works, or at least maybe one part of it. When we're asking Heather some questions, I'm hoping that um, all of you might in the meantime get started on our uh, hands-on portion. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to draw a maze. And you're welcome to draw your own maze, whatever that looks like. Um, and uh, Caroline can throw in the chat. We also have an example maze um, that you're welcome to use. So part of our materials in the list was a piece of paper and a straight edge and a writing utensil. So go ahead and start creating uh, a simple maze. I'll show you what mine looks like. Super simple. This is going to help us out later in the program. And I think it's something to occupy our hands while our, uh, while our minds and eyes are being occupied by talking with Heather. Heather, I'm really excited about hearing some more about your story. Our Minecraft Makers uh, Girls Only Camp here at the museum this week submitted some questions for you. Um, huge shout out to this amazing group of girls. Thank you so much for being part of this program. Um, if any of our uh, viewers have any questions, feel free to put those in the chat and we'll do our best to get to them uh, in the time that we have with you all. Heather, I would love to ask you some of these amazing questions that um, our Girls Only Camp asked. So um, up first, we have um, some questions from Ellie and Max, um, and they ask, who or what inspires you? Did anything inspire you to create the games that you've made? Wow, Ellie and Max, I love that question. Um, you know, I like working with people, and I'm really inspired when I work with, it's not a specific person, but just it's an attitude. When people are really passionate about what they want to do, and the vision that they have for something. As a producer, it's very inspiring for me to go and help that person realize their vision. Um, when I was younger, you know, I, I was very close, to, or I am very close to my parents. So they were very much an inspiration for me because both of them are somewhat entrepreneurial thinkers, of very creative people. And so I have a lot of those traits that are useful in game development because you have to be creative but as a producer, you have to be focused on actually making the game too. So thinking like an entrepreneur, um, how are we gonna actually get this game made is very useful. And so I got inspiration from my parents for that. 
I love the way this is something that you've um, already acknowledged is how much you work with others. It is an effort that you do with a whole group and a whole network of people. I love that, Heather. Um, we have some another question from uh, Lucinda and Zoe. They ask, um, was it hard to make your games? Um, was it fun or was it easy to make an entire game? So um, Lucinda and Zoe, I will, I, making games is a lot of fun, but it is hard to do. Um, often when I'm talking with other game developers, we joke like if people really knew how hard it was to actually make games, they wouldn't believe it. And the reason that it's hard, um, it's because it's when you're trying to create something that you want somebody else to interact with and enjoy and have a good time with, you don't really know exactly what other people might find enjoyable or fun. So if you're making a game like Fortnite, you know, you might make choices initially um, with how you communicate things to the players about, hey, go here, pick this up, but it just doesn't feel good. And that's something that's very hard to define. So it requires a lot of iteration. And so that part is difficult is you can come up with like a really awesome idea, but you have to have a lot of different people play it and provide feedback and then iterate on it. The other part that can be somewhat difficult is a lot of times um, game designers and game developers come up with these really fantastic ideas. And this was especially true when I first started my career, but we didn't have the technology to actually do the thing that they wanted to do. And so um, just figuring out from a technical standpoint how to do some of these cool things can be very, very challenging. And then finally, um, one of the other pieces that I think is very challenging is when you've got your game made and you're like, okay, I think I'm ready to, to send it out in the public and have people play it, you have to do a lot of testing on it. And while you're testing, you're going to find a lot of weird bugs that you may not have found earlier because you weren't as focused. And so sometimes you find these weird bugs and it can take a long time to figure out how to do them. So it's a fun kind of hard, but it certainly requires a lot of work and a lot of people who really know what they're doing and are very dedicated to making the game the best it can be. So making challenging games can be challenging. This um, reminds me of one of the questions we have from Nara, which is, in order to learn to make a game, do you need to play one? Oh, Nara. Okay, so your parents may or may not be excited to hear this, but yeah, I definitely say if you're interested in making games for a living, it is very important to play games. Now, you can play any type of game. You know, some people love uh, puzzle games. Some people like exploration games. Uh, some people like games like Fortnite. But I would say that if you really are interested in doing this, you want to play lots of different games, even ones that you may not normally play, because what you're trying to do is to learn about how games are made. And part of how you do this is just experimenting or experiencing how games um, work from different types of genres and things like that. So I, I highly encourage playing lots of games. Also super useful to even play board games and card games because there's many mechanics and ways of thinking that you get just from playing board games and card games. So if you play a card game like Rummy, there's a certain aspect of strategy, right? When are you gonna lay your cards down? What cards are you collecting? And these principles are also applied in video games because video games are all about creating something that has strategy and entertainment and fun for the players. That's a great perspective. So yeah, playing both like video games is important, but also um, uh, analog games, <laughs> if we can call them that, um, board games and card games are another really important, really important part of learning how gaming itself works. Um, you mentioned uh, Fortnite and Kylie asked, um, how did you come up with Fortnite? So Kylie, that's a great question. And I, I think the best answer is, is I, I didn't come up with Fortnite. Um, actually, Fortnite was in development um, long before I started working at Epic Games. And the way Fortnite came to be is uh, there was what they call a game jam. So sometimes companies will host what they call an internal game jam where they have the employees break up into small groups and the employees brainstorm different game concepts and ideas. And then they create a prototype of it, either an analog non-digital prototype, but if it's a game company, it's usually going to be you know, a digital prototype. And then everyone plays them. They get feedback from everybody across the company. And then 
they might say, you know what, this actually prototype looks really fun. Let's see if we can develop this into a full game. And that is how Fortnite originally came to be. So Epic had a game jam and they came up with this concept and they started fleshing it out. By the time I came to work on the project, the prototyping phase was done and they were now ready to build it into a, re uh, I say a real game, into a full game. Because when you make a prototype, you know, that's only a few minutes of play. Um, and you start iterating on that and coming up with different ideas. So the original Fortnite prototype is very different from the Fortnite that you probably have played. But when you come up with a game idea, uh, again, to emphasize it's a collaborative process and it usually involves a group of people. Most of the time, if, you be, if you're like, hey, I wanna become a game designer because I have this burning idea for a game that I want to make, the chances of you making your specific game are probably going to be lower than you would imagine because number one, games are a collaborative process and that idea is going to change and morph as you talk to people about it. And oftentimes companies, depending on which companies you work at, already have ideas for the types of games they wanna make. And so um, it really is like this very collaborative process. Um, it's very, it changes a lot because everyone is focused on feedback and iteration and making the game as fun as it can be. So on, on the flip side of that, I mean, if you know that you want to create games and you don't know exactly what kind of game it sounds like being part of the team is what you want to be. Absolutely. You learn so much from being a team member and from understanding how everybody does their job that it can help you as you start to think, well, what's, because I have game ideas too that I've come up with smaller things that if I wanted to get a small group together, I could do it. But my thinking is really refined because of all the experience I've had with helping other people realize their game ideas and working with teams. Um, we have another question from uh, Ella who asks, what did you feel when you found your game got so popular? And we even had friends uh, in the chat who was saying how much they love Fortnite. So working on Fortnite was definitely the highlight of my career, Ella. Um, when we were working on the game before it was released, the team felt very confident that the game was awesome and that people were going to love it. But it's not very often that you work on a game that then goes on to become, honestly, the most popular game in the world. And I remember um, walking into a restaurant. <laughs> the company had given us Christmas, ugly Christmas sweaters that were Fortnite Battle Royale sweaters that only employees of the company got. And I remember walking into a restaurant in December with my sweater on and I just felt so proud of walking in there because everyone was looking like, oh my gosh, where did she get that sweater? And it said dev team on it. So yeah, it is, it is the greatest feeling in the world, you know. To create something that so many people love and that inspires so many people. Yeah. Um, I definitely know um, having run some summer camps that year, I saw plenty of uh, Fortnite dances and a lot of good yeah. stuff. <laughs> Brings a lot of people a lot of joy. Um, I, had, I had one last question um, from our uh, girls only camp and it's from Lainey. Uh, this is gonna be just before we start our activity. Lainey asks, do some men think you're crazy for trying to get girls into gaming? <laughs> if they do think I'm crazy, I haven't heard about it yet. Most of the time, people are very excited to open up the game industry, specifically to girls and women. That's one of the areas where the game industry as a whole recognizes that having a team of diverse people is going to create a much stronger game experience. So, you know, maybe people do think that's a little bit crazy, but I have not necessarily come face to face with them. Most, I mean, I would say, honestly, all of the companies I've worked with are very invested in um, having a group of people that ha or have a passion for games and they work together on it. More welcoming. Um, I know that sometimes players at the player level feel that it may be a little more exclusive, but I'm glad to hear that there's a move toward including more people. Absolutely, absolutely. Awesome. That's been so cool. Thank you so much um, to our girls only camp for those amazing questions. I saw that we have some other um, really good questions in the chat. Um, I think what we will do is we're going to go on with our activity, our hands on activity for the day. And then if we have a little time at the end, we'll, uh, we'll have Heather answer some of those if that sounds okay to you, Heather. Absolutely. 
Awesome. We've heard a lot more about what Heather does um, and some, heard from some awesome questions. Um, and I'm, I'm going to bring us back to the activity that we started um, when we uh, when we first started talking and that was uh, we were kind of drawing a maze or maybe we already had a maze printed out. So um, we're thinking about what you do uh, making video games and what uh, how we can talk to computers to create something like a video game because and correct me if I'm wrong, wrong Heather it sounds like we can't just say to the game all right go ahead and just work make an awesome game for me. That is correct. <laughs> There's a lot of code where you have to be very explicit with the computer about what they should be doing based on various inputs um, that impact what game experience you're going to have. Sure, that makes sense. You, you mentioned code. So when we're talking to computers, we kind of have to speak their language. What language is that? Um, computers use what's called binary code. It's zeros and ones. And so at a very sort of high level, zeros and one just is an indication of something is on or off. And then you take all the zeros and ones and you can group them together in different ways. And then that creates a language that the computers understand. So what the programmers is, do is that they write something in a programming language and then this input gets converted into binary and interpreted by the computer and then they know what they're supposed to be doing. It's kind of a crazy concept when you think about it. <laughs> it. It is. I'm trying to imagine all of the information that goes down into making maybe something as simple as your name into something like binary. If you can't put letters of the alphabet, you have to find the code version of them in just zeros and ones. That sounds like a lot of information. You, you said computers need really explicit instructions, so they need to be told exactly what to do. We're going to talk about kind of what that step-by-step -step process looks like when we're putting together a program to make a computer do something, like to make a game on a computer. The the central question of, our, uh, of today's activity is how do we get our character to move through our game's maze. How do we tell it what to do like we would talk to a computer? You're going to need a few more materials. Um, we mentioned that you're going to need um, your, your piece of paper for your maze or your printout. Um, you might need that uh, writing utensil and a straight edge or a ruler to uh, draw your maze if you haven't printed it out. Um, you will also need some play-doh or clay, something moldable. I have a little bit of play-doh here with me. Um, you'll need a toothpick, although I found that also um, a craft stick works as well for our purposes. Um, I think in a pinch, fingernail wood as well, but I think it helps to be able to use those implements. Uh, and then the final thing, and this is optional, but I think it makes it more fun, is having a little player character. So I have this little guy here. I don't know if any we have any dinosaur people uh, among our viewers, but if you know what type of dinosaur this is, definitely let me know and I'll shout it out. <laughs> We've got all of our materials and we're going to, um, we're going to see a little bit what it's like to program a computer to talk to, in a computer's language. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to experiment cam and Heather and I are going to talk about how we start this process. So I've got my entrance and my exit to my maze. And I guess I would start it like this. We're pretending that this is our computer game, my friends. Um, how do I get my character through the maze? How on earth do I get this guy here over here? And I should say, we're assuming a few things, right? We know that we can't go over any walls. If we bump into a wall, we can't move anymore. Oh, this is great. We have some suggestions in the chat. We can tell our character to go straight. Um, we can program, ooh, movement buttons. I like this idea. Um, we can move it. You're exactly right. Now, if I'm playing an analog game, I'm just moving around. But if we're saying that this is our video game, we need to give it a command. So we had a um, suggestion that our first command be, be go or be straight or forward. So what we'll do is grab our Play-Doh and we're gonna grab a kind of a chunk like this and roll it into a ball like that. Once we've got our ball, you can flatten it to make actually what one of my friends said in the chat, a little button. And this button, um, we can put a command on it using our toothpick. 
So when I'm thinking about the really um, straightforward, simple language of computers, I don't know if I can put the zero and one binary version of move straight, but I am going to keep it simple. Instead of writing move straight, I'm just going to put an arrow like this. All right, Heather, did I do it? Well, now you need to have some sort of input that tells it to look at the arrow moving forward. So when someone said, um, I think put a button or something on it, that is where on your keyboard, you would say, when I press this, move it one arrow forward. Ooh. So you've got the command there. Now you need to activate the command. Which yeah, I love that. So we even got started before we could get started. So I'll go ahead and make another quick button here. That is my activator button. I like this. Um, I'm just gonna make it be a little play button like a little play triangle like this. So this yeah. is activator play button. So now we have our first step. I love it. So if we go forward, Heather, have we solved the maze? Well, you've moved one step forward. <laughs> so you're still stuck at the maze. We say that this is the command to just move forward. We would move forward and then we'd hit a wall. So I'll ask my friends in the chat, what should we do next? Ooh, we have some great suggestions. We can do a down command. We could have it turn. There's definitely different ways that it could turn. This is a lot more complicated than I thought, Heather. I was just thinking I can go from one pretty easily to another, but there are so many steps. Yes, the computer wouldn't know. And so if you want it to turn, you have to be very explicit and tell it which way to turn. So there's ways that we can do this. And this is kind of maybe where the art of the science of programming comes in. There's different things that we can tell it to do. Um, I think for our purposes, what I was thinking is I would just make a turn arrow in the direction that I want it to go. So I want it to turn this way. On my maze, that is turning right. So here is my new command. It is turn right, so it's a move straight, then turn right, and then is it able to move or did it just turn? It just turned. Oh, so you mean I've got to put another command down? Mm -hmm. All right, so now I have to make it move now that it's turned. Although we could use the play button that you had before, if you wanted to say, when I hit the play button, move it the direction that it's facing. Oh, so maybe I'll build that on. Yeah. This is what I'll say. So there's different ways to make code. I can have a code that's maybe a little bit more repetitive that tells it a different command every time. Mm -hmm. Or I could tell it something like this to just keep on going. So I'm going to attach that here to my play button. Okay. So now it has the command to keep on moving. So once it turns, it should keep going. And what does it do but hit another wall? <laughs> what do you think, friends? What's next? I think I have to make another button. Oh, yeah, we need another turn. Yes. And I think one of the interesting things is if you were programming this in a computer, you would be able to set this up probably on a grid so that each time when your dinosaur moved one square, it would do a check to see, should I turn or should I keep going forward? Because in this particular maze, you're, he is going forward until he hits a wall or she is going forward or it is going forward until it hits a wall. And then once it hits the wall, that's when you tell it which way to turn. Um, in a more sophisticated program, if you were on a grid system, you could tell it to move forward one, then turn so that you don't even have to go all the way to the wall. Oh, to sneak through that little opening that's already there. Okay, so right, because I'm thinking about um, if I'm watching this in game form and I'm giving it its commands, it's moving the right ways, but it can only go boom, boom. And that's not a very, uh, that's not a very elegant movement, I guess. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Maybe that is how this type of dinosaur moved, though. I really like this idea. 
So friends, it's almost like a puzzle, right? Now I've got to figure out my next direction, the one after that, the one after that. And I have a lot of more directions to go before I reach the end. So I have more buttons that I would need to make. But if I do pause our progress right there, just for the sake of time, I just wanted to take a look at what we've got, right? I've got all these different commands and although we're making them out of Play-Doh on a computer, they're not little circles with arrows. Um, we would be writing them as different commands. So it's just kind of a string of ideas. So maybe I have something like this. I can squish it all together since it's made of Play-Doh. And this weird string of ideas here is how my game works. So this is my little string of code. I love calling it code because it does mean something, but you have to know how to read the code in order to see it. Because if I just, if I just showed this to someone, I don't think they would know what to do with it. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so we've created a little string of code, and this is something that we could continue to work on to get our dinosaur or our player character all the way through a maze. Um, Heather, you had a really good point that we can also put in additional things to our code to give it some more flavor. Like if I want my dinosaur to not just run into walls, I want it to take steps like a real dinosaur, or if I want to animate it doing anything else. Or so adding think, sound to it. Oh, that's even a different thing, a sound. Okay, so I could do a sound command. So this is a lot of Play-Doh potentially. Yes, yeah, so, yes. By the time you were to write up the code for that, it probably would be a page long. Wow. And that's, is that in Plato or is that in just writing it out? Oh, probably <laughs> in writing it out. Plato, I don't know, you might need two cans. <laughs> <laughs> so we were talking about how it's so much information, but it has to start step by step. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of different steps. There's ways to kind of um, make fewer steps for ourselves by saving time, making more elegant code. And there's, um, there's a way that we can practice that, not just with Play-Doh, but online. You were mentioning to me that there is a site that you like to use that's really great for um, practicing this mm -hmm. kind of coding technique. What was that site? Um, Scratch. Ooh, so scratch.mit.edu, which I'll have Caroline throw in the chat really quickly. This is an online resource if you've, if you've run out of Play-Doh um, that you can use to continue to practice your coding skills to get into the mindset of someone who is developing a game. And I saw somebody mentioned in the chat, there's also another website called code.org that has tons of stuff at all different grade levels where you can go and experiment with learning different coding concepts. This is perfect. So code.org. Thank you so much, friend, for pointing that out. And Heather, thanks for shouting it out. That is perfect. So there's lots of different places to get a lot of practice in this. I, I'd love to ask Heather, is there anything else if we're interested in various aspects of game design, maybe the programming part, maybe the art part, maybe different uh, pieces of this whole team's effort to make something? What is, what is something that we can do next? Or what could we look into? I would definitely Scratch is great because it helps teach you about all aspects of it because you get to make your, if you want, you can make your own art and use that as part of your game. Um, for the game design stuff, it's really important to, to do and learn. So you're going to make a lot of mistakes. And that's something I like to emphasize as well. Don't be afraid. It's okay to make a mistake. It's okay to make something that someone says, this isn't fun. Don't get upset by it. Just be like, well, can you tell me why you don't think this is fun? Because that's the only way that you're going to learn and really make something that people will enjoy doing. Um, and for programming, you know, I always say code.org, things like that, that start teaching you the fundamentals of how programming is structured is very useful. That's great. Yeah, and I, I love, um, we, we talk a lot on Lab at Home about how important a teacher failure is, how uh, much a part of science it is. Um, friends, you definitely saw when I was making my code, how many mistakes I ran into and had to learn how to fix those problems. So it's all part of the process. I appreciate that, Heather. Awesome. My friends, if you're interested in hearing a little bit more from Heather, we're going to stay on for a few extra minutes. And I'd love to ask you, Heather, some of the questions we had in the chat earlier from our viewers. 
So we have um, our friend Alex who asked, uh, well, who says, hi, Heather, and asked about animating games. How do you animate games? Okay, so when you um, make a character, um, there's a lot of people that are involved in even making a character that is animated. So the short answer is this, you make a character model and let's, for example, use a 3D character model. A modeler will make that and then they will add a skeleton to it. And then this model is handed over to the animator and then the animator will basically create animations by moving the bones and the skeleton. That, that's the basics of it, that they have a skeleton and that they animate. Um, and, you know, usually it's somebody that that is their specialty on the project. Like they are only animating the game. Yeah, that's an important point though, to talk about how it's not, it's not like it starts out looking like the finished product and that's what you manipulate and move around. And it's also not something that you do by necessarily typing in commands. There are programs that help you use these skeletons to move things. That's really cool. Yeah, they would use a, a three, there's a lot of different 3D art programs out there. And so the artists and the animator use these programs that makes it a lot easier for them to create the animations of the models that they're doing. Some of the modeling programs, you basically are moving vertex points in and out on different models to create sort of the 3D thing. And then the more vertices that you have on a 3D shape, the more defined the model's going to look. So if you play a game and the models look kind of chunky with flat planes, that is a low polygon model because they've used less polygons. So the model looks chunkier versus a high resolution polygon model where the squares are so small that if you looked at a, what are the things called those geodesic domes, that the smaller those triangles are that make up those domes, the more rounded the dome looks versus chunky looking. Right, it's right. Um, a, a realistic game versus something like Minecraft, which does look very pixelated. Yes, absolutely. Um, Alexa asks, um, how did you become a video game producer? So I did not know that video games was something that I could make a career out of. And so when I graduated from college, I was living in Los Angeles, which has a ton of game companies. And I just was looking for different types of game uh, positions in the entertainment industry, like film and stuff. And I got an entry level job at Activision because they were interested in people that had film backgrounds um, to come and help them make games. And so it was the entry, it's the lowest rung on the ladder, you know, and so it was a lot of like, meet, you know, taking meeting notes, ordering food for people, but the opportunity afforded me the chance to talk to all these different development team members about their jobs and what they did. And so I was able to learn on the job about all kinds of different things. And I realized that video games was something that I wanted to make a career out of. And so once I realized that, I then tried to figure out, well, what part of it do I, would be a good fit for me? And production seemed the best fit because it's working with people, helping them collaborate. And I wasn't, I didn't know how to compute, like program computers, um, but I knew enough technical stuff to be able to converse with programmers or artists or designers about what support or what problems they were trying to solve to help them solve those problems. Something um, that I've that I've read uh, of something that you said um, that I really really liked um, was saying if you've got about eighty percent of something, go for it. That yeah. you don't have to know every single thing before you start doing something. It's maybe uh, about uh, getting just the most of it and then going for it. Is that would, would you say that that's absolutely accurate? because if you wait until you know everything, you're never it you you won't make much progress. So, and I will say most of the time people are very happy to help. So if they're like, hey, I see you've almost got it. Now you just need to do this and this. Like people will volunteer that and you can't be afraid to show that you're not exactly sure what's supposed to go next. Um, generally people want to see other people succeed. And so getting there with what you know is good. I was able to talk a programmer at one of the places I worked into doing lunchtime programming classes because I wanted to learn more about programming. 
and he offered to do this. And so we had a couple people who sat in, they want to help, you know, and so you have to be open to accepting the help. And what a great, yeah, what a great opportunity and what a great, yeah, use of, of, of the network and building the network. That's what games are all about. Yep. All right, I have one last question for you. And this is um, from Azel who asks, um, what is a game uh, you made that really stands out in your memory as something that you really were able to express yourself in doing? One of the most favorite games that I worked on, I mentioned when I first um, introduced myself was called Never Alone. This game was very special because it was a game built um, with, co-developed with an Alaska native tribe, the Inupiats, who wanted to make a video game that celebrated and shared their culture with the rest of the world. And so I was involved very directly with that project where I traveled to Alaska um, and I met with the tribe and the game development team and together the tribe was involved in determining the concept and the design. Now they'd never made games before, but they knew what content they wanted to share. And so it was this really unique co-development process where the tribe put out a game that people really enjoyed, not just Anupiat people, but people all across the world. And it won several awards and, um, really, I think, showcase that you can still make a commercially viable game, which kind of, you know, you have to make money if you want to keep making games. So this game was entertaining. And so for people who wanted to just play an awesome game, they could do that. But for people who wanted to learn more about this culture and this tribe, they could do that as well through this game. And it's called it. Never Alone. It's about a young girl and her sidekick that's an Arctic fox that have to traverse through the terrain of Alaska and solve problems. It's a platforming game. So if you want to check it out, it's pretty much shipped on every platform. That is awesome. Thank you. I, I, I'm so glad that you got to be a part of it. And I'm really interested to learn more about it. Yeah, it just goes to show you more diverse view viewpoints um, means more amazing stories and more amazing games for Absolutely. everybody. That is so wonderful. Um, this has been such an amazing opportunity, Heather. Thank you so much for being here with us, for answering all of these questions, um, for, <laughs> for helping us learn how to play the program at least a little. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Caroline, for putting that in the chat. Um, this is Heather's website. If you want to learn any more about her, heathermakesgames.com. Um, thank you, Heather, for being with us. Thank you to all of our viewers for checking it out. Um, one more big wave to the uh, Minecraft makers girls only can't for when they watch this on YouTube later. Thank you all for being a part of it. I hope that we might see you next week for Little Lab at Home when we are going to be exploring geology and the um, characteristics of rocks. Oh, that's thank you so all so Yeah, it's going to be a good one. I hope so. Thank you so much, Heather. I hope you have a great rest of your day. I will. Thank you. See you later, friends. Bye-bye.